Hi, my name is Alex Dolphin and welcome back to another episode of Ex-Ante. Today we're going to discuss the case of Thing v. Lachusa. This case is heard in the Supreme Court of California in the year of 1989. Let's go ahead and jump into the facts of the case. So Thing is the plaintiff, Lachusa is the defendant. Lachusa was driving a vehicle when he negligently ran over Thing. Thing was a very young child and was severely injured. Um, Thing's mom then came running out. She didn't see the incident. She didn't see the car crash. That's very important to note. She came running out, saw her child there bloody on the ground um, and suffered some severe emotional distress. I think that we could all envision ourselves in that scenario and, and try and envision the type of severe emotional distress, but I think we could grant that it would be severe to see your child bloody um, in the middle of the street, sadly. So the mother um, is trying to sue the driver of the vehicle for a negligent infliction of emotional distress. So the court is grappling with what we call the Dillon Rule. The Dillon Rule is the earliest form of the bystander rule. It was developed by the Supreme Court of California in the case of Dillon uh, v. Legg. So the components of the Dillon Rule, um, the first component is that the plaintiff for negligent infliction of emotional distress was close to the accident. Number two, the plaintiff witnessed the accident um, and because of their witness of the accident, they experienced severe emotional distress. And then number three, the plaintiff was closely related to, um, to the individual that was actually injured, right? So this is the bystander rule or the Dillon rule. The court in Thing v. Lachusa is having to decide whether they're going to extend this bystander rule to encompass uh, the mother of the child. Right? It's a very similar fact scenario as Dylan v. Leg, where a child was just ran over in the street and the mother witnessed it, saw the child was hurt. They allowed the mother to rec recover for NIED. This case is a bit different because the mother didn't actually witness the accident. She just came out afterwards and saw her child there laying in the street, right? So the court is having to decide whether or not they're going to apply the rule, the Dillon rule, to scenarios where someone doesn't actually see the accident but comes in and sees the aftermath of the accident. So the court ultimately decides they're going to constrain the Dillon rule and hold that it only applies when individuals actually see the accident. So they're not going to allow the mother of the child, so the plaintiff in this case, case thing, to recover for NIED. They're not going to allow her to recover because she didn't actually witness the accident. So the court says that it's very important that that prong two of the Dillon rule be satisfied and that you actually be a contemporaneous witness of the accident, of the negligence, for you to recover from NIED. So that's the rule in the case. Um, it just reaffirms that prong of the Dillon rule that you actually have to witness the accident. Um, some ex-ante implications from this case. The first would be that we're going, the court is making, I believe, to be a wise decision in constraining the NIED uh, cause of action, right? Because if they were to broaden this, I mean, you could think about how remote this might become, right? So if someone was injured and then six hours later, someone got a phone call and then they got that phone call hearing about the injury and had a heart attack. Um, you know, is that really the purpose of negligence and tort law to protect plaintiffs that are so unforeseeable from the accident um, itself? Um, and I think that most people would say, no, it's supposed to protect the immediate people. Now, on the other side of that, um, there's not a massive difference between what Miss Thing experienced in, in Thing vs. Lachusa and what Miss Dylan experienced in um, Dylan v. Lake, right? The difference isn't that much because just by witnessing the accident, I'm sure you saw your child get ran over, which is absolutely tragic. The same thing happened in Thing vs. Lachusa, except for she just didn't see the child get ran over, she just saw the aftermath, which I think many would argue is equally as bad, maybe not quite as bad, but still pretty terrible to have to see your child bloody face down in the street. Um, you know, just because you didn't witness that accident, you, she was still pretty close to the accident and did see that um, experience. So I think the other side of that though is just to harp on the foreseeability, um, Mr. Lachusa obviously didn't go out driving his vehicle intending to cause an accident that day. He was negligent, right? There was nothing intentional about his, uh, his actions. So, and, you know, the duty of negligence is to uh, protect foreseeable plaintiffs from foreseeable harms. And how foreseeable is the harm um, to Lachusa um, of 
you know, miss things, suffering, emotional distress. And I don't think it's that foreseeable. And I think for the court, um, they want to only grant foreseeability if the people are in that zone of danger, right? Like if Mr. Uh, Lachusa had driven down the road and seen the mother playing with the child, then there's definitely an increased sense of foreseeability for Mr. Lachusa um, to inflict emotional distress upon her. Whereas if she, he can't see the mother, um, then it becomes much, much more difficult for that defendant to actually have, you know, had a duty to someone to prevent a foreseeable harm. So thanks so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you'd like to see more, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.